European Union has a birthplace, then it is here, in this little cottage in a woodland west of Paris. The dream was to make peace among European countries. If the EU has a founding father, then it is this man, Jean Monnet. In the broken remains of post-war Europe, together with a trusted circle of advisors, over coffee and cognac and fireside chats, they dreamed of a continent prosperous and at peace. For me, European Union is a great thing because I'm free to move. It was really easy to move to the UK when I went there as a medical professional. The EU has grown from a community of six nations to a union of 28. More are waiting to join the club. So why do some say that the dream has become a nightmare? All we have known is unemployment, the taxes, and all the, the disadvantages of this European Union. Jean Monnet had a vision in this house, and from here he set the whole European project in motion. But what's become of that original vision? What state of health is the European dream in today? Jean Monnet had an idea to bind the economies of Europe so tightly that war would become impossible. He took his plan to the French foreign minister. Together, they formulated the Schumann Declaration. L'Europe ne se fera pas d'un coup, ni dans une construction d'ensemble. Elle se fera par des réalisations concrètes, créant d'abord une solidarité de fait. Those early Europe builders began by pooling French and German production of coal and steel. It was the first step towards de facto solidarity and would lead, they hoped, to a federation of Europe. Hello, sir. I'm Gabriel Gatehouse. There aren't many of that generation left today. So you, you were there at 65. Georges Bertoin is the last surviving member of Jean Monnet's original cabinet at the European Coal and Steel Community. It was the first institution out of which would grow the European Union. The dream was to make peace among European countries stable and credible. Then there was another element. The element was prosperity. So the problem was not only to rebuild Europe, but to modernize Europe. And in this respect, we, we were looking at the example of the United States of America, and especially the size of the market. Yes, so this is you. <laughs> yes. And, and this is Jean Monnet. Peace and prosperity, that was the goal. Five years later, six countries would sign the Treaty of Rome, establishing a European economic community. But the ambition was always for a much closer union. The driving powers were France and Germany, which together formed the central axis of a future European Union. This is Breisach on the Rhine in Germany. Across the river, Neuf Brisac in France. These two towns that saw three wars in 70 years are now the heartland of the European Union. Here then are two towns on opposite banks of the Rhine. They're living together in peace. Their citizens can travel freely backwards and forwards across this bridge. And whatever side they happen to find themselves on, they can pay for stuff in a common currency. In so many ways, this is exactly what the European project has always hoped to achieve. Over the decades, Europe brought with it all sorts of benefits, jobs, common rights and protections for workers, health and safety laws, equal pay, parental leave. But you don't have to dig very deep here to discover that the river still divides. On the French side, there were once many factories. This one used to produce pistons for the European car industry. 
but in 2013, high labour costs forced it to close. Je pense qu'en France, on paye trop d'impôts. Les taxes professionnelles, les impôts pour les, pour les salariés payent trop cher. Et je pense que c'est pour ça que beaucoup d'entreprises en France ils délocalisent vers les pays de l'Est. Back across the river, in German Baden-Württemberg, they have full employment. This region is one of the richest in the EU. And here, we stumble across what appears to be the most pro-EU place in the Union. Welcome to Europa Park. Meet Euro Mouse, the mascot of this Europe in microcosm. Nestled among the roller coasters are many of the member states. Scandinavia, Portugal, Greece, which includes Pegasus, Cassandra's Curse, uh, and the Flight of Icarus. There's even a British section. Black cabs, fast food, and Shakespeare. Who knew the EU could be such family fun? Which is your favourite bit of the park? Our favourite bit is Scandinavia, I think it is. Scandinavia yeah. bit, right. The okay. wooden roller coaster is brilliant. Is it? Yeah. The history of Europa Park reads like a sort of German industrial fairy tale. It was founded by the Mack family, stalwarts of German manufacturing since the late 18th century. The park opened its doors in 1975, inspired by the vision of a united Europe. We choose Europe and we think it was the best way to go, even nobody believed at that time that Europe would be as big as it is today. As much of Europe struggles with an economic crisis, in Germany the dream of prosperity still burns bright. Today, nearly half the park's workers are from other EU nations. We are growing really fast. We're about to open a water park in 2018, where we need another 700 employees. So it's quite difficult because the um, unemployment rate is so low in this area. You just can't get find the workers. You can't find the workers. Despite Europe's economies traveling at different speeds, its nations are today united in peace. A hundred years ago, millions of young men lost their lives in these fields. Along the roads that wind through Europe's heartland, history lurks around every bend. This is Strasbourg, a city once fought over, now at the heart of the European project, the French home of the European Parliament. Throughout the EU's development, from its beginnings in coal and steel, the direction of travel has been one way, towards ever closer union. Its founders envisaged a United States of Europe. Maybe that was a bit naive, but we thought we were position to change European history. It sounds a bit stupid, but we believed in that. The rhythm, you see, you know, at that time, we had the backing of public opinion on the continent. But Monsieur Bertrand's dream of a federal Europe is no longer popular, even here in Strasbourg. These young activists are out campaigning. They are the far-right Front National. You know, uh, I was born in uh, 1992. You were born in 1992. And uh, it was a year of the uh, Treaty of Maastricht. Yeah. And so we haven't known this European dream. All we, uh, all we have known is uh, only uh, unemployment, um, uh, the, the, uh, the taxes, and uh, all the, the disadvantages of this European Union. We, we haven't known this European dream. For us, it has been a failure. The Front National is booming. A year from now, its leader, Marine Le Pen, could become president of France. 
She's promised to follow Britain's lead and hold a referendum on EU membership. It's a real problem because... Uh, Julia says she'll vote out. Some people worry that a party like yours is leading Europe back towards nationalism, back towards the place where it was in the 1930s. You're right. The, the, the European Union is leading us back. That's the problem. It's the, uh, the European Union that creates unemployment and violence and a feeling of insecurity. Apart from a few road signs, there's nothing here to tell you that I've just walked across an international frontier. And not just any old frontier, because it's not so very long ago that this was the Iron Curtain, stretching all the way from the Baltic to the Mediterranean, a line of barbed wire dividing Europe into binary opposites. All of that changed in 1989. The fall of the Berlin Wall led to the biggest expansion of the European project since its inception the accession of former communist nations to the European Union. This is Seget, Hungary's third largest city on the border with Serbia. Since joining in 2004, Hungary has benefited from billions of euros of EU investment. But for the citizens of the former Eastern Bloc, perhaps the most cherished European principle is that of freedom of movement, the ability to travel, to live, to work anywhere in the Union. For me, European Union is a great thing because I'm free to move. It was really easy to move to the UK when I went there as a medical professional. It was free to move, free to cross the borders. A nurse in a care home in Seged earns one-sixth of what they could earn in the UK. Institutions like Britain's Public Health Service, the NHS, rely on workers, both skilled and unskilled, from other EU countries. Freedom of movement between the nations of the EU may be causing concern elsewhere, but not here. But the opening up of borders inside the Union has highlighted a deeper sense of unease one that was thrown into sharp relief last summer. The migrant crisis. Europe's inability to forge a common response boiled over at the train station in the Hungarian capital Budapest after Germany unilaterally declared itself open for refugees. And so began the mass movement of people across an unwilling and disunited EU. Hungary was the first to close its borders. Others have followed suit. Tilos kimondani, hogy a bevándorlás bűnözést és terrort hoz az országainkba. Tilos kimondani, hogy a más civilizációkból érkezők tömegei veszélyt jelentenek az életformánkra, a kultúránkra, a szokásainkra és a keresztény hagyományainkra. The Hungarian Prime Minister has taken these ideas from the fringes into the political mainstream. He's called his brand of politics illiberal democracy. For him and his supporters, the biggest threat to their European identity is the European Union itself. Ha a népvándorlást meg akarjuk állítani, először Brüsszelt kell megfékeznünk. Európa jövőjét ma nem azok veszélyeztetik első helyen, akik ide akarnak jönni, hanem a nemzetköziség brüsszeli megszállottjai. Nem hagyhatjuk, hogy Brüsszel a törvények fölé helyezze magát. There is a growing dissident movement in European politics, one which rejects ever closer union in favor of a strong nation state. On border control, on foreign policy, on the euro, Europe does not speak with one voice. The fall of the Berlin Wall once looked like the triumph of liberalism in the drive towards ever closer union. But that momentum has stalled. And so, more than a quarter of a century after they tore down the Iron Curtain, they're putting fences back up again. This is perhaps the biggest crisis of unity the EU has ever faced. It was here, in the provincial Dutch town of Maastricht, that the EU as we know it today was really created. 
It was here, with the signing of the Maastricht Treaty, that the European community became a union. We go in search of the document, which is housed in a sort of modern castle, apparently surrounded by a moat. Yeah. Eric Lemons is the curator, the man who guards the treaty. This is it. This is it. Right. It's, uh, it's a copy. It's not the original treaty. Aha. Uh -huh. We persuade them to open up the cabinet. <laughs> so we can leaf through the treaty for ourselves. Right. How significant is this document? This treaty? Yeah. Very significant. Uh, the European Union was founded in this treaty and of course because of the common European currency which was also established yeah, by the, the Maastricht Euro. Treaty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then came the crisis in the Eurozone, and that posed a fundamental question. Can democratic sovereignty survive monetary union? <laughs> Nowhere has that question been as stark as it has in the country where democracy was born, in Greece. The rise of the bread queue is a sign that things have gone very wrong indeed. This is the town of Nausa, north of Athens. Nearly half its residents are unemployed. When Greece could no longer pay its debt, it was bailed out by the EU in return for a strict regime of austerity. This austerity, these uh, measures, uh, they're so cruel, especially for, young, for the, the young generation. It's so um, difficult to keep up. That's what I think. The Greeks are in a bind. Last year, they voted overwhelmingly against austerity. What did they get? Austerity anyway. Why? Because many fear that life outside the Euro would be even worse. And so, Greece's left-wing government, elected on an anti-austerity programme, made a choice to implement policies it didn't agree with in order to remain part of the club. From the very beginning, there were questions. Can you have monetary union without having political union as well? Can you have a single currency and lots of different economic policies? What Greece shows us is that you can't. From the beginning, the founders of the European Union realised that prosperity was the key. The key to avoiding future conflicts and repairing a continent wrecked by war. In German, they have a single word that describes their country's post-war resurrection. Wirtschaftswunder. Come to the Porsche factory in Stuttgart and see it for yourself. The crisis in the Eurozone, in Greece and elsewhere, has kept the Euro weak. And that is good for Germany's export-driven economy. But the workers at the Porsche factory know that German success also depends on the survival of the Union. Why did Germany bail out Greece? Not because they make such good Russo or something. It's um, because all are connected somehow to each other. And if one goes um, broke, then I think um, the whole system is collapsing. Here is a confident country, and one that mostly believes in the European project. They're frustrated with those who just don't seem to get it. Ich denke, es ist richtig für uns Briten, uns das von Europa herauszusuchen, was uns passt. Ja, das ist jetzt wirklich exakt das Gegenteil der europäischen Idee. This is the heute Much of Welke's humor seems to revolve around sausage, but he uses Wurst to make serious points too about Germany's unease with its role as leader during the economic and migrant crises. Well, the thing is, 
uh, in Germany there's an expression that's called, and there's again the Wurst, Durchwursteln, you know? <laughs> right, what does yeah, that mean? It, it, mingling along and seeing what happens. Muddling and the, and through. Muddling through. Can we continue like that? Can we, can we continue really just sure. to sausage our way through Europe? Sausage our way through <laughs> Europe. I invented a whole new expression, I'm really proud of that. And do you think it will work? <laughs> Well, it worked for the, for the, uh, for the last f five or six years. I'm not so sure if it's really the master plan for, for the next years. But you, uh, of one thing you can be sure, there will never be a German government which will say, OK, now we really take the lead. If you uh, uh, lead the way and, and the rest follows and it doesn't work, they hate you for the rest of your life. Even we want to be loved, you know, that's the sad truth. Even the Germans want to be liked. It's been more than 65 years since Europe set out upon a journey that has led to today's complex union of 28 member states. But from the very beginning, the founding fathers identified one country as the key to the European project. We wanted to give Germany a path to recovering their sovereignty with us, not against us, making sure that the German recovery will not become a threat, but an asset. And this is what happened. It just happened that the most powerful country in Europe believes in Europe, the European dream. And so we're back where we were at the beginning of this program, in the German town of Breisach, overlooking the Rhine into France. Whatever you think about the post-war European project, its greatest achievement surely is this, that it does now seem inconceivable for any member of the Union to take up arms against another. If the European dream is peace, then the EU has succeeded. Europe's heartland and its newer members are today undoubtedly more prosperous too than they were in the aftermath of the 20th century wars that spurred Europe towards greater integration. But as the Union struggles to find common responses to the crises of the 21st century, the question is, how much further should that integration go? That is the issue that now divides this continent.